Every parent loves to see their child happy as their playful, rambunctious self. When they're healthy, that's all possible. With appointments available at Seattle Children's, your child can get the compassionate care you expect when they need it. So if your child needs specialty care, make an appointment today because safe, timely care can make all the difference. Hope, care, cure. Seattle Children's. I would say, honestly, that the heart would be serving the individual person and, and looking at them in that clear way and that what is it that they need? How can I make them better today and help set them up for success in whatever it is that they're going into tomorrow? If that means we need to slow down on a concept, make sure that it's understood. I just think that the, it's really just serving the individual in the way in which they're going to succeed, I think is the, the absolute heart of how this program runs and what makes it really truly so successful. Every parent loves to see their child happy as their playful, rambunctious self. When they're healthy, that's all possible. With appointments available at Seattle Children's, your child can get the compassionate care you expect when they need it. So if your child needs specialty care, make an appointment today because safe, timely care can make all the difference. Hope, care, cure. Seattle Children's. I would say, honestly, that the heart would be serving the individual person and, and looking at them in that clear way and that what is it that they need? How can I make them better today and help set them up for success in whatever it is that they're going into tomorrow? If that means we need to slow down on a concept, make sure that it's understood. I just think that the, it's really just serving the individual in the way in which they're going to succeed, I think is the, the absolute heart of how this program runs and what makes it really truly so successful. Every parent loves to see their child happy as their playful, rambunctious self. When they're healthy, that's all possible. With appointments available at Seattle Children's, your child can get the compassionate care you expect when they need it. So if your child needs specialty care, make an appointment today because safe, timely care can make all the difference. Hope, care, cure. Seattle Children's.
I would say honestly that the heart would be serving the individual person and and looking at them in that clear way and that what is it that they need? How can I make them better today and help set them up for success in whatever it is that they're going into tomorrow? If that means we need to slow down on a concept, make sure that it's understood. I just think that the, it's really just serving the individual in the way in which they're going to succeed, I think is the, the absolute heart of how this program runs and what makes it really truly so successful. Hi, good evening, and um, I just want to welcome everyone. If you're in Seattle, this is a gorgeous evening, so I want to thank you ahead of time for showing up. My name is Elaine Sulkin, and I'm the CEO of ParentMap, and welcome to the Rise of Cancel Culture, a talk for parents and teens featuring author and therapist Joe Langford. This is a topic that... Um, I think is so important and I'm so glad that we are doing this and that Joe is joining us. And we talk about the content at Parent Map as an arc between popcorn and broccoli. The popcorn being not tonight. It's the out and about free fun things that you can do with your kids. Sometimes more essential than anything on a rainy February day. And then broccoli, which is health development and things that are really disturbing the balance of life and family, which cancel culture is. Um, so before we begin, I just want to give you a couple of housekeeping rules. Tonight is going to be recorded for the sake of everybody who registered. Parents are busy and we want everyone to have access to watch this for their own education. Please, please, uh, use the Q&A icon at the bottom and send us questions. We will, um, Joe will talk for about 35, 40 minutes and then we'll do a Q&A with him. And we really couldn't do this without you. So thanks again for showing up. And of course, our live presenting sponsor, Seattle Children's Hospital and also the Dartmoor School. So thank you to our sponsors. Joe is not only a master's level therapist, sex educator for tweens, teens, and parents in Seattle. He's also an author. We are super proud to be the publishers of his two books, Spare Me the Talk, A Guy's Guide and A Girl's Guide to Sex Relationships and Growing Up. Joe speaks internationally using information, education, and humor to help parents and professionals increase their knowledge and self-confidence as proactive defense against the unfortunate consequences that sometimes accompany teen sexuality behavior and development. And please check out Joe's site, beheroes.net um, for more information. And, and with that, I am thrilled to welcome Joe to the talk. So thank you. There he is. Hey, Elaine. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much um, for that uh, great uh, introduction. I always really appreciate uh, doing events with Parent Map. Um, it's always a really nice thing. I um, am, like Elaine said, a therapist and um, and a dad and an author live in Seattle, but kind of travel all over the world doing talks for parents and organizations. I kind of specialize in that 
intersection between um, adolescence, sexuality, and technology, and the mess that those things can sometimes make. And so um, I, I think I was a good candidate for talking tonight about this concept that we call cancel culture uh, tonight. Um, most adolescents are using their devices and social media for most of their social interactions, as the rest of us do as well. Um, from asking people out to turning people down to exploring aspects of their personalities and learning about the world, um, trying to get attention, uh, making each other laugh, even being mean to each other. Statistically, screens are almost always involved with almost all teenagers. Um, kids and teens are using the very kind of adult tool of social media long before their brains are fully developed. Um, kids are likely going to post things that five years from now they're going to regret. Hopefully, for most kids, those things are going to just be limited to like unfortunate haircuts or embarrassing moments. But if it is an inappropriate photo posted by a spiteful ex or some other bullying issue that took flame, if it's um, a well-intentioned or ignorant faux pas or a moment of inappropriate behavior caught on video by a bystander, the chances of something backfiring, biting them in the ass, or going kind of bad viral are huge. Um, it happens all the time. I specialize in sort of sexuality. And so, you know, a percentage of the calls and emails that I get are from uh, people or families who have a kid that crossed someone's line and got in trouble for it. So I've dealt with this issue several times over the last several years that I've kind of seen a rise in it, which we'll talk about some of the history. Um, you know, we've seen this in politics, we've seen it in celebrity from Colin Kaepernick to Aziz Ansari, um, from Harvey Weinstein to JK Rowling, even the potato head formerly known as Mr. Um, cancel culture as we understand it right now, it doesn't really discriminate among gender lines, philosophy or race. Um, and that means that it can impact kids as well, and it does. Um, cancel culture, basically to give a definition, um, to cancel means to draw negative attention to a behavior, an offensive remark, or an unforgivable action, and then reject the person responsible through blocking, unfollowing, calling them out on social media, basically boycotting them, right? So the idea of um, withdrawing attention or support of a person or a business because they've done something you don't agree with, um, or something that isn't maybe in the best interest of the larger population or something that harms a marginalized population is not a new concept. It's actually very, very old. The trend of calling someone out on social media is a new and powerful version of this. And it has its roots in the early 2010s, but it came into collective consciousness around 2017 coinciding with the rise of online, um, like the, the hashtag Me Too movement, right? The specific term cancel culture is much newer and credited most often to kind of right-leaning politicians who both complain when left-leaning voices rally against perceived injustices and engage in cancel culture themselves when their own values are threatened. However, because of the efficiency, because of the prolific nature of social media, cancel culture isn't just for famous people with massive followings or, or influence. It's made its way into the larger community and youth culture. And so now parents are concerned about how it can affect their kids. So tonight I wanna to talk about why this concept is important. I wanna talk about the impacts and the implications of this phenomenon and then our role and responsibilities as parents around supporting our kids in light of this. I wanna talk about kind of what to do if this happens to your kid. I wanna talk a little bit about how to kind of best try to avoid uh, either this happening to your kid or your kid participating in making this happen for somebody else. And then we're gonna do some Q&A. As Elaine said, if you have questions that pop up, go ahead and throw them in the chat and then she will um, give them to me later on in the talk. <clears throat> when I'm done with my spiel here. So why is this phenomenon important, right? Social media and specifically, like I said, the Me Too movement have been a driving force in this over the last kind of five years and a large, I think, positive shift in our culture, wherein, you know, after hundreds and hundreds of years of it being more shameful to be the person who had someone do something terrible to them, now it's becoming more shameful to be the person that did the terrible thing, right? Mm -hmm. So cancel culture can seem very negative, but the concept can actually bring out positive changes in real life. Big picture, this is humanity using technology to join together and rally against the normalization of things that are not or maybe 
only used to be okay, right? Common themes are racism, sexism, uh, phobic, anti-climate and irresponsible gun control behaviors and policies. And I think most importantly, rape culture, which is why in many ways, I think accountability culture is a better term, but I don't control these things. So we have what we have. You can cancel anything if you don't like it. That's just personal preference, right? But accountability has more of a, someone is actually being hurt or wronged tone to it. Whatever we end up calling it, cancel culture is real. It's relevant, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. And so it's up to us to kind of create a relationship with it so we can help our kids do the same. Cancel culture has been driven primarily through social media. And by virtue of that, it lends itself strongly to national movements and youth culture. And I personally am wholly impressed on how allied and aware and woke Generation Z is. I don't know about all of you watching this, but I was nowhere near as informed or interested in politics or culture as these kids are. People, including like middle school kids, are thinking about the world in a not self-centered way. They're thinking about their place in it and they're taking steps to hold people accountable who cross certain lines or act in bad faith. And though there can be abuses, the bones of this, I think, are ultimately gonna benefit us as a species. The implications or the impact of this stuff on the larger culture involve communities that unite against someone who's done something that works against that community's best interests. And it can be really empowering. It can illuminate and create natural causes for things that people have been able to get away with in the past and help people think twice maybe before posting or behaving in potentially offensive ways. And the line and definition of natural consequences has been changed, but that line typically bends toward justice, right? Um, and if any of you have seen sort of like what they call Karen videos, which I think are hilarious, um, you kind of understand what I mean. For individuals, the lesson that we need to take from this is not only to learn to pay attention to our behavior, but to learn to acknowledge that when we screw something up, uh, we need to leave a trail of breadcrumbs going forward, showing remorse and showing different behavior going forward, right? <clears throat> In the case of James Gunn, who is a director of some of the Marvel movies, he was called out uh, last year for some pretty terrible jokes that he made like a decade ago. And he was fired as the director of the third Guardians of the Galaxy movie. But he worked really hard to not blame anyone but himself. He had a string of people come to his defense with evidence over the years of how he's changed and was a different person now than he was back in the day. And then he was able to be reinstated back by Disney. In contrast to that, right, we have like Justice Brett Kavanaugh, who grew up and went to school um, and some of those now famous parties with several good friends of mine, who does not seem motivated to show accountability for his past crappy behavior. And in many ways is exactly the same guy he was in 1987, right? So people, especially kids, make mistakes. Learning from fouls and failures allows us to build up social skills, develop a sense of self, develop a sense of relationship with other people and the larger world. Because the mistakes that kids can make today can come back and bite them in the butt. Maybe by Monday morning's math class, maybe not for 30 years, right? The goal is really not to make mistakes, although obviously that would be nice. The goal, the number one job, I think, in some ways for young people is learning how to take responsibility, how to make it right when possible, and how to leave that trail of breadcrumbs going forward. The spectrum of cancelable offenses can vary quite a bit. And being canceled basically means that everyone around you now questions their involvement with you because in the eyes of the masses, you only represent that thing that you were canceled for. Right? And this is a problem. The psychological impact of canceling, much like bullying, can lead kids to feel isolated, ostracized, to depression, anxiety, impulsive behavior, lots of other kinds of negative coping strategies, right? And while the level of accountability that it sets on people I think is admirable, and I'm glad that people, especially those with less privilege, have the means to call each other out, it's unfortunate that it reduces people to one solitary act. As adults, I think we're able to sort of navigate this a little bit better. We can understand that context, but kids have a really hard time with it. Um, this is especially true, I think, when we involve kids in this scenario because it can make it really hard to find those opportunities for improvement, right? 
it can be really, really devastating for a young person and their family when personal or damaging information is made public in these kind of viral ways. Reputations get tarnished, lives get kind of turned upside down, relationships can get ruined. The social impact is almost always negative. Um, that's kind of the point to counseling, right? Um, and so I wanna talk a little bit about steps that can be taken to minimize the damage, both for offenders and the offended um, in, in our role with that as parents, right? So generally speaking, we're told to be understand this, that when someone crosses a line or says or does something hurtful or harassing to us or someone else, it's almost always better to use our words and help them try to understand that what they did was not okay, right? As adults, as parents, as grownups, right? We have that luxury, but with kids, it doesn't always go down like that, right? So I coach kids that involving the support of adults when these kinds of things happen, a parent or a school authority when something negative happens is the typical best step. But a lot of young people don't have access or the patience, honestly, for that. It can be a lot easier and frankly more effective to just call them out on Instagram, right? And so that is a lot of kids sort of immediate go-to as it is for a lot of things. Ideally, as parents, we've set the stage with our kids already. We've kind of talked to them about ethical and moral behavior. We've defined what we mean by okay or not okay behavior. We've discussed the difference between what's appropriate and what's inappropriate. You know, if you've heard me talk before, I, I speak about this a lot. We throw those words around a lot, right? Healthy, unhealthy, appropriate, inappropriate. But when kids are in my office or on Zoom calls now, talking to me about them and I say, what does that mean to you? How can you tell the difference between something that's okay or something that's not okay? What is your family's definition of appropriate? They can't always tell me. So I really encourage families to sit down as a team and kind of come up with some operating definitions that align with your family's values. What do these words mean to you? And kind of help your kids wrap their brains around that concept. I think it's important to be talking about privilege when we do this, how substances can change people's behavior and invite poor choices. I think talking about consent and how easily and how much their words and feeds online can affect other people on the other side. But if or when they screw up and this kind of social consequence happens to your kid, it's important to figure out exactly what happened and then ask what your kid's reaction or their experience is, what they're going through, right? which is typically in my experience, sadness, anger, and worry are the three big ones, right? So as parents, we can listen and validate those emotions without necessarily agreeing with the behavior that they did that might've been inappropriate, right? Being aware of their actions and their impact in the world can help kids prevent from getting canceled, but it can really just take one small action to be deemed cancel worthy. Cancel culture moves very quickly. And once you're canceled, it can take a long time to come back. If this happens to your kid, it's important to remind them that cancel culture isn't necessarily permanent. When it's like Bill Cosby, right? Maybe it's one thing, but it's actually quite difficult to wholly cancel a 15 year old, even though to them, it really can feel like that in the moment. Um, being canceled is not universal, but again, to kids, it can feel like it's the whole world responding, right? Um, canceling marks a moment in a person's life. It doesn't define the whole person, but again, kids don't necessarily understand that distinction, right? With the exception of incidents that involve things like death or sexual assault or violence, like targeted cancel strikes mostly fall under a larger umbrella of either social justice or maybe cyberbullying or both, there's kind of an overlap there sometimes. And they can burn very hot and very bright, but at the same time, they can burn out pretty quickly as well as new social bonfires take flame. There's always something going on on Instagram, right? So we need to explain to them that it's not everyone and it's not forever, it's a moment. And the moment will pass and it's a moment that 100% they can recover from, right? <clears throat> while we're on the subject. I know that the focus tonight is primarily these bonfires impact on our kids, but I've learned that it is also important to consider the possibility that maybe our kid can, or is gonna also be one of the torch wielding villagers, right? Because we all like to think of ourselves as a Katie, but sometimes we're the Regina and that happens on accident as well. If you didn't catch that, that was a Mean Girls reference. <laughs> if you haven't watched it, 
please do with your kid. That's homework right there. Um, it completely lines up with this topic and it will help you springboard into a bunch of fantastic conversations having to do with tonight's topic. Plus it's just a really awesome movie. But anyway, in service of encouraging our kids to not cancel others, reminding them that using their words is more humane and helpful than trying to cancel them on social media. Not only does canceling make it difficult for the canceled to find and create chances to improve, but it can actually prolong the damage and drama for the person who was hurt in the first place by having the story where the situation shared and reshared and reposted and on and on, right? So when or if your kid goes bad viral because of more serious infractions like abusing their privilege or their power, um, assaulting somebody, racism, misogyny, phobic behavior, those other kind of social crimes, um, the consequences and the responses can be a little more serious, but the initial response is basically the same. So these, this is sort of my list for the responses if you're taking notes on this, right? Number one, obviously, stand behind your kid, right? Whatever the reason for your kid's bad viral outbreak, they're going to be embarrassed, they're going to be ashamed, they're going to be scared, right? And so as parents, we're tasked at that point with putting on our poker face, swallowing our judgments, and being a safe space for them, right? This can be super hard in the moment, especially if the situation involves crime or behavior that clearly goes against your family's values or a boundary issue that you were not expecting from your child at all, like maybe photos of them naked or something like that. Those are some of like the most popular categories that I run into on this theme. And there'll be time later to process their and talk about boundaries and say things like, what the hell were you thinking? We can do that later, right? But in the early stages of a situation like this, they need to know that they're safe and that it'll pass and that you're there for them. I cannot emphasize how important that part is, right? And speaking of kind of emphasizing and important, this does not mean to shield your kids from the natural consequences of their behavior, right? Do not shield your kid from the natural consequences of their behavior zero parents want to see their child screw up or be laughed at or be ostracized or even arrested, right? But swooping in to shift blame to others or deflect the consequences, especially if they've been earned, ultimately prevents our kid from learning a probably needed life lesson. It thins their skin, it stifles their maturity, it increases um, like an inaccurate sense sometimes of invincibility or entitlement or worse, both. Right. And plus, it makes it much more likely that whatever the mistake was they made, whether it was like a nude pic or a gross public display of cultural ignorance, it makes it much more likely that's going to happen again. Instead, what you do is you respond appropriately. Right. Again, if it's smaller scale stuff, disagreements amongst friends, bad breakups, mean girl stuff. Right. Many times the best response is no response. And the typical sort of cyberbullying protocol is appropriate. But when the situation is involving bad public behavior of that sort of larger caliber, the rules are a little bit different. One significant difference is that doing nothing is maybe gonna make the situation worse. So damage can be lessened in these situations typically by kind of leaning into the storm, which is hard to do, right? Um, and addressing what happened before it gets any bigger, even harder to do these days. Um, and working to control the flow of the narrative by taking charge of the story as much as you can, right? The protocol, which I call it when I work with families, is swift, same, and don't feed the flames, right? So when I say swift, I mean time is of the essence. In the very least, best practices dictate releasing some kind of statement, acknowledging the mistake with a short apology within, say, maybe 24 hours, right? Like I said, this stuff kind of burns pretty quickly. This shows awareness and responsibility, right? I really recommend that kids solicit feedback from third parties, other grownups who are not in it in the same way we are, like a, like a boss, maybe a trusted friend, a community leader, a teacher, a therapist, something like that. Someone who can be neutral and honest to prevent them from posting something that can come across as maybe flip or defensive or more inflammatory and make them even more vulnerable, right? When I say same, I mean, if it was, you know, a three thread tweet that caused the problem, then one Instagram post is not going to cut it, 
right? If it was a 20 minute YouTube rant, then a 280 character apology on Twitter is not gonna fix it. Don't apologize on TikTok for something that happened on Instagram, right? Staying in the same medium and giving at least as much energy to the apology as it did to the thing itself is most likely to reach the people who were impacted and those who are responding and resharing the information, right? And then the third one is don't feed the flames. So don't let your kid engage in a flame war on social media. After they send that initial apology or that statement, have them unplug for a little bit. Do not read the comments, right? Um, some people are gonna support them. Some people are not going to support them. Um, if you're a functioning adult, you already understand this. Reading the impulsive and cathartic rants from anonymous randos uh, are not gonna change um, anything that you or your kid do, right? It, any, they're not gonna do anybody any good. So if you're already under a deal of stress, just keep your kid away from the comments. How you respond to this kind of stuff makes a huge difference in how hot and fast those flames of a bad viral situation are gonna burn. So both your kid and kind of the public are gonna be looking to you as the adult representative, right? To act as like a voice of sanity, a mediating voice of responsibility, right? And so if the response is rude or just more of what the problematic thing was in the first place, it's just gonna draw more negative attention and outrage. Um, so whatever you can do to not let that happen is a good thing. And if you think you know that you can't really jump in and help your kid respond without making it worse, then find someone else to do that right for you. Um, when something terrible hits the fan, it's just better to unplug the fan than to like fling more terrible into the blades, right? So apart from all of that, right? So if your kid gets canceled, if your kid um, does something that gets some like negative viral attention online, helping them navigate that stigma is really critical, right? So it's really important that kids learn to stand their ground, socially speaking. The worst thing they can do is isolate themselves. So continue to engage in regular activities, continue to go to school and go to class. Not letting the posts or the paparazzi terrorize or victimize them is really important. Not just with regard to the specific incident, but in terms of their own ability to weather social storms and stay strong. Um, and therapists can help with this part, right? It's important to help our kids acknowledge their mistakes. So above all, focusing on responsibility, right? Young people sometimes need to be reminded that even if they didn't intend to hurt or humiliate or harass someone, it doesn't mean that didn't happen, right? If they hurt someone's feelings or they offended someone or they did something that crossed the line of okay or just seemed kind of rude, if they you know, shared personal details of someone who trusted them, or they posted something that was like racist or sexist or phobic accidentally or on purpose, they just need to fix it, right? When I work with kids, I'm just, I say no excuses, no minimizing, no, but somebody elsing, right? No explaining to others why they shouldn't be upset. Um, no one ever died because they just took responsibility and apologized, right? Kids need to learn or actually be taught how uh, to how to and when not to respond, right? Haters are gonna hate, trolls are gonna troll. That is the world that we live in now. It's the, inter the internet is here, it's not going anywhere. If someone's calling your kid names, they're focusing on their character rather than the thing that they did, right? Rather than talking about their actions or talking about like your kid as a whole person, um, or they're clearly just using this behavior as a reason to vent their own angst, then responding to that kind of stuff is not going to be necessary or even helpful, right? Instead, try to focus on um, like, like your kids' responses on comments that contain legit feedback or concerns or questions and use those as opportunities to let the audience learn about your family standards and your values to explain the situation is out of character for your kid and remind them that your kid is human and flawed, just like all the rest of us, right? So help your kid own their mistake as soon as possible. Stay respectful as possible while you're doing it and stick to the facts and lead with your heart, right? And again, do it with your kid, not for your kid, right? Um, the truth is gonna be their friend. So whether your kid's been wrongfully accused or misunderstood, or they did violate a social contract or crossed a line of some kind, it's really important to stick to the facts. Facts will outlast the hype and overpower the drama. Um, 
don't encourage your kid to lie. <laughs> Just don't do it. Um, I, I deal with this kind of stuff a lot and I've done it several times over the years and there's like always like a small percentage of parents that just want to sort of like make stuff up and try and get out of it. People, the internet is a powerful resource and the truth is out there. And if your kid hasn't learned it yet, please convince them that poor behavior online can and probably will come back and bite them in the feed eventually, right? And again, could happen tomorrow, could be 20 years from now, but the truth is going to come out. So just don't lie. Um, instead, just help them learn how to apologize well. This is a fantastic skill um, that is coming into play, you know, much in the way that, um, you know, learning how to um, provide like actual constructive criticism and feedback to people is, is a skill that a lot of us didn't learn how to do well until college, maybe our 30s, right? Like some people are still working on it. Um, but those kinds of like in, important skills for for dealing with other humans come into play and are kind of necessary by age like 12 now, right? And so is learning how to apologize. A lot of people just don't know how to do it, right? But there's power in apology. And the best way to help your kid repair a reputation or undo damage or regain trust, whether or not you're talking about being canceled, is just to help them learn how to say they are sorry, right? The audience in these kinds of situations, they're going to want a response. They're probably going to deserve one. And it's our duty as parents to help our kids provide an appropriate one if necessary. And so in a digital age, there's kind of three parts to an apology, right? So the first thing is admitting what they did, right? So do not let your kid be afraid to say those words, right? Apologizing for what I did or the thing that happened last week is not enough. It's really important to be clear about what they're apologizing for, right? Um, sharing their own feelings about the impact of the behavior that their behavior had on somebody else, right? We call this empathy. And this is the part where they say that they're sorry. So never ever in any circumstance, let them say sorry, that you were offended or upset, right? That does not end well. If anyone has tried that in real life, it does not end well. Um, and then showing that they understand why what they did was wrong. So explaining what they learned from the situation and how they've learned and grown from the experience goes a really long way. And this is much more important than why they did the thing in the first place, right? People don't really care about that. They'll make up their own stories anyway. But explaining what you've learned and why you're different now because of the situation um, really uh, calls to people. Um, other factors that can come into play in these kinds of situations um, if your kid already knew that the thing was wrong and then they chose to do it anyway, then apologizing for that is important as well. This is a global village now, and we have varying degrees of privilege, which play significant roles in human interaction, both online and off. So generally speaking, the more white, male, straight, cisgender, and wealthy you are, the more privilege one has, right? And it's important to call out the role that those things played in the situation, right? And if the goal is for your kid to actually apologize in a respectful adult way, um, it's got to be a part of it. And then make it right. So notice how asking for forgiveness didn't wasn't anywhere on that list that I talked about. Instead of asking for forgiveness, I talk to kids about um, that it's more responsible actually for them to explain what they're going to do to be the kind of person someone could forgive and often make a plan to make it right. Because the fourth part of a legit apology is not about asking something from the person that's been wronged, right? It's about explaining what we're gonna do differently from now on and going forward. And then of course, we wanna follow through with those things, right? So I really wanna emphasize that it's just not enough anymore to simply apologize and lay out a plan. Anybody can tweet words or cry on camera. What makes the difference is calling out a solution to the problem that we've caused or participated in and then showing that we're a person of our word. There will always be those who are not gonna believe a sincere apology or won't be satisfied with restitutions and are still gonna feel hurt and angry. But by forming and executing a thoughtful or well-intentioned restoration effort, you and your kid will be able to say that you did the best thing you could do to right that wrong and change the narrative and that you're gonna do better next time. And then go forward, right? And except in extreme circumstances, reputations will totally improve over time, particularly for kids who have tons of years ahead of them of hopefully doing the right things, bouncing at the scales and dropping those breadcrumbs that I was talking about, right? 
it'll take time to live down a soil reputation, um, especially if there was like some kind of media frenzy around it, but it will smooth out eventually, right? So utilize that time to slow down, take a step back, focus on your expectations for your kids' behavior, both in real life and online, right? Take the opportunity to help your kids recognize these universal truths. So everybody makes mistakes, our behavior impacts the people around us, and because of our technology, we are more easily and widely connected to each other than we've ever been before. And so as I kind of said at the beginning, like kids and teens are using this very adult tool of social media way before their brains are fully developed. And if your kid has access to social media, and I'm guessing they do, it's the number one topic of calls and emails that I've gotten in the last year. Um, here's some guidelines, okay, for how to do this and kind of set the tone um, so to hopefully prevent something like this from happening. And if you follow me or you've heard me speak before, you're gonna have heard some of this before, but a tune-up never killed anybody, right? So specific guidelines, set expectations on time on who your kids are interacting with, what's okay, what's not okay to say. We are all on our screens more than we have ever been in the last year. And even those of us who have had kind of more strict guardrails have relaxed a bit through the quarantine when the world went kind of sideways. And I support that, it's helped us survive. But as the world begins to open back up, and we return back to something resembling whatever normal was, it's a good idea to return to some clear guidelines for their screen behavior, right? And you can use any time of year to do this. We've got schools opening up and kids returning back to school. Springtime is actively happening here in Seattle. Um, summer's right around the corner. Birthdays, you can use any kind of time marker you want and say, hey, you know what? Time, time lock, here we go. We're gonna do it differently going forward now, right? So please utilize those opportunities. Um, have bigger picture conversations with your kids. Apart from you know, the sort of specific factual like house rules, we also need to be proactively engaging our kids in tough but necessary discussions about things like race and class and sexuality and gender, shooting for empathy and inclusivity. The country, America right now, is divided more than it has ever been, like in the last 150 years, right? And there's plenty of people who still believe that those topics are up for some kind of debate. Maybe even some of you in this Zoom right now, but whatever the situation is for you or your philosophy, like we are not going to be around as long as our kids are, right? And so we owe it to them to help them create a relationship with this world. And the evolution of this world is leaning however slowly sometimes, toward empathy and inclusivity. And stances or behaviors that contradict that, including impulsive and inappropriate Instagram posts, are just not going to fly. So one way to help this is to be part of your kid's social media experience, right? Um, it is easier to give coaching and call them out uh, when they screw something up if we're participating in their online lives with them, just like we do with their real lives, right? It doesn't cover everything, but if we attend to their social media the way that we do their homework or their friendships and check in on what they're doing or posting or texting, um, if we ask them about their social media experiences in the same way we ask, how was your day today, right? Um, all those kinds of things continue to be really important until their brains are done cooking, which for the average person is like 25 years old, right? So if your kid's on Instagram, get on Instagram with them. If your kid is doing Twitter, learn how to drive Twitter. Um, if you don't understand how to do those things, have your kid do the teaching for you, right? The internet is forever. So accountability is very important. Your kid may think that if they only have a few followers or they're texting to a private group chat or even just one person that what they do or say is protected or consequence free, but it is not, right? Kids really need to understand that every time they post, they're contributing to a constructed online version of themselves that can be very easily dismantled. They need to understand that making mistakes is part of being human, but the internet is not a patient or forgiving place for that stuff. And kids need to understand that owning mistakes and making amends is key. And this includes what they've learned and how they've changed and evolved and what they've done differently to move past their mistakes. And like the Guardians of the Galaxy, we can't go back in time, but we can leave those breadcrumbs, right? And those breadcrumbs look like understanding the concept of privilege and where your kid falls on those spectrums and talk to them about that. It, they, those breadcrumbs look like empathy and inclusivity um, consent education, saying something when they see someone else posting hurtful content, especially if it's their own friends, 
believing women, right? All these things, understanding them and then acting accordingly, right? So hopefully this is some information that has kind of helped you sort of wrap your brain around like what cancel culture is, why it's here and happening right now, how to avoid it, um, hopefully, but how to deal with it if it does happen to your kid. And then I think um, we've got some time for some questions. If uh, people have submitted some questions, I think, hopefully. So Joe, first of all, I, I always think in not every, every lecture, but um, in each one of these events, I learned so much and I, I just have to thank you for outlining, you know, what a sincere apology looks like. There's nobody that can't do better on that, probably. And um, there's a lot of questions. So I'm going to kind of put a few of them together. Um, you know, I think one of the things that is causing, I'm curious, you know, it's part of a question, is the, the, the absolute disastrous of equation of the prevalence in social media. Bullying is as age old as mankind, womankind, but you add in virtual classrooms and you don't have any um, authority figures or parents really having a view in. So that's, that's more of a comment, but um, I'm gonna ask, let's see. Can you comment on can you comment on the part of cancel culture where an incident is falsely claimed? The accused has no platform to defend themselves or tell their side of the story, and the accuser offers no proof. This has become prevalent in alleged sexual assault claims in teens, which we're starting out with a big one because it's life destroying. Yes, it, it definitely can be life destroying when that when that happens. So um, it, it is a really difficult thing uh, when that kind of thing happens. I think many times uh, the best response to that is, it, like I said, you know, making some kind of statement about it, right? So um, you know, this is my understanding of like, this is what happened or what, this is what went down at the party. This is what I did. This is what I said. And if I cross the line, then I'm very sorry, but here you go. And kind of put their version out of there as well. Right. Again, don't let kids do this by themselves, right? Like sit down with them or have a third party who can be neutral, sit down with them and help construct a response to it so that that can be tagged on to the response that's going out. Um, you know, I advocate um, for believing people around sexual assault, especially women. And so this makes it difficult because there can be times where stories are twisted around or things are copied and pasted and passed on and the story gets out of control and ends up being like the telephone game where, you know, the, the situation that's out now that everyone's talking about in the lunchroom at school is not what actually went down. So how do you deal with that when you don't have a voice is just try to have as much voice as you can and then step away from it, right? If it's truly a case of sexual assault, then likely there's going to be some other kind of intervention from law enforcement or something like that. There'll be an investigation. The truth can come out. Um, but if it's just a case of like, they said, they said, then, then there's not really much that you can do other than offer your own perspective and then try to stay away from it. Again, do not read the comments. Um, that kind of situation specifically is a place where people often just want to direct a lot of their own angst and anger as well. Can you, can, you know, you said something, especially if the accusation is coming from a woman and um, I, yeah, can you talk a little bit more about that? Because it, it makes, it makes males that much more vulnerable. And I, I have heard of experiences where, you know, boys have a really hard time rallying around the guy that they think was wronged because the female accuser, you know, it, it, it buys into the history and the pendulum swing for correction but it leaves that individual at a serious loss. Yeah, and it does. And it's, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, no, go ahead. So it is, it is complicated, right? 
because uh, for you know hundreds and hundreds of years, like like the the assaulted, the abused haven't have been the ones that didn't have the voice or the opportunity to say anything, right? And social media is helping that change and make that happen. Like I said, ultimately, big picture, that's a really good thing. There can be abuses to that, right? And so right now, it is a rough time for guys in that sense, right? Because it's easy to be called out on something and the consequences can be quite large. When, we're, when we can kind of rise above the trees and think about this sort of conversation, like as a culture, right? Um, this part is necessary. It's ugly. Um, there's going to be problems with it, but we need to shift from this thing where, you know, it's, 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 uh, you're more powerless and full of shame if you had the thing done to you, uh, as opposed to if you were the person who did the thing. And statistically, you know, the false accusations around this kind of thing, it's like one or 2%, depending on the study that you read, right? It's like, it's a very small number. It happens, but it's a very small number. And so I think the ethical default would be to believe women. And it is so easy to cross lines, right? It is so easy to offend someone. The sex education in this country that we have is ridiculous. Like it is terrible, right? With very few exceptions. And actually there's some great places here in Seattle, but in general, the kids do not get sex ed in school. They get like lessons in reproductive anatomy, right? They get biology, they get how babies are made, right? But they don't get anything about flirting. They don't get anything about romance. They don't get anything about, um, about touching, non-sexual affection, any lesson like that, they get nothing. Most kids, a lot of kids get their sex ed from porn or their friends who don't know any more than they do. So it, and then if you talk about like parties and either sugar or pot or alcohol or whatever, like you pour that onto the mix, like it is just so easy for something to go wrong. And then if you talk about screens in terms of that, you know, just even with language, stuff like body language, humor, sarcasm, um, you know, misspellings, like there's so many ways for things to be misinterpreted, misunderstood, or to land on someone in a really negative way. Um, so it, the, 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 the soil is really fertile to grow something that's not going to end well, right? And adolescence has been that way from the beginning of time. But so the social media aspect and this rise in cancel culture has made the consequences a little more dire than they were before, right? In the 80s, like, Somebody might just say like, that guy was a jerk to me at a party. And then they talk about all their friends and mostly would stay in the school and the kid would learn a lesson or not or whatever. But now it can get a little bit, it'll get more bigger than that. So um, it's just, it's difficult to navigate this. <clears throat> um, can you talk about when the line, when the, you know, you know, the line between bullying and cancel culture, like, how, you know, where do parents intervene? How do you, how do you try to get preventative with it? And how do you suggest other, you know, I mean, there's a lot of questions about, you know, when you enter, how you enter, how can you be somewhat preventative with your kids? And like you said, knowing, you know, their social, you know, what, it, knowing what they're doing online, of course, but it's such a fine dance, you know, you're not, especially now you're not in the car with them. You're not hearing their voices. Um, right, and, but a lot of their voices are online. And so, you know, if, if your kid's on Instagram and you're on Instagram as well, you're much more likely to see something when it happens. Or you can see like when, when things start to shift and you can tell which way like the landslide's gonna go and you can say, hey, you better unplug from this situation or whatever, and just do an intervention that way, right? Um, you know, kids are the expert with their devices in terms of like how to post something on Instagram or what to do with a story or all the all the that kind of lingo and the technical parts of it, right? But the human elements, like how do you interact with someone, right? How do you think this? How do you think that statement that you wrote with no context around it is going to land on your audience or a particular person, right? Um, 
kids don't necessarily understand that stuff. And so that kind of pre-education that we can do as parents is great. That kind of in the moment, like watching and listening, right? If you are a part of your kid's Twitter feed, then you you can see what they're posting, right? And so they're not in the car necessarily while you're driving around, but this is a really wonderful window into their world, right? And so I think that is really key. Most, most, yeah. That feels like an accurate statement. Most of the time in, when I've dealt with these situations, the parents were really like sideswiped. So they kind of came out of nowhere. They had no idea anything was going on. And in some cases, like stuff had been sort of percolating for like weeks, right? And so if, if the parents had been a little more like involved in what was going on with their kids' lives or had some of those pre-conversations, here's topics you don't post about, right? <laughs> these are topics that can inflame people or words that you do not say, right? Um, it can really just, it can proactively avoid a lot of drama and trauma down the road. I mean, you're saying how behind the times our schools are really in, in sex education, but I wonder if you have any experience with cancel culture within the school environment and how, is there any awareness within the school environment of how to handle this or parents and kids? Um, so with, with parents, uh, it's kind of me, <laughs> right? There's, there's some other people that do it as well, but there's just not a lot of people doing parent ed around technology. Um, in schools, samesies, but they are getting better, right? Um, I think that there are definitely some, and again, in the Pacific Northwest, there seems to be more than in other places. In Canada, Canada's kind of kicking butt with it, where they're teaching you know, like digital citizenship in schools and weaving that into curriculum, if not even just like two weeks in health class or something like that, where they talk about digital citizenship um, is super helpful because there's just nobody doing that, right? And it is an incredibly important skill for kids to have right now. Um, you know, they're just, they're not going to learn the stuff in school, right? And I think this whole conversation is really new, right? Um, you know, smartphones have only been around for 15, 16 years, right? The, I, the first iPhone came out, I think, 16 years ago. Yeah. So, you know, th this is all really new, you know? Uh, the, the ability to like something on Facebook is, we've only been able to do that for like 12 years. So when you think about that, like how deeply those roots have gone, but it is a new conversation. We are still as a, as a, as a species kind of getting our sea legs with this stuff. We don't know what we're doing yet, right? And then our offspring definitely don't know what, what they're doing. So stuff's gonna happen. We just need to do our best. And, you know, encouraging the schools that you, that your kids are attending and, you know, asking them what they're doing about digital citizenship and are, how they're incorporating that um, into their curriculum is a really powerful thing. But like with the sex ed conversation, for us as parents, it's really our job. We have, if we want our kids to be savvy around sexuality, around digital citizenship, we have to be the ones who are going to take the steering wheel on it because the schools just can't, right? Um, I'm going to read this question. I haven't read it yet. It's a long one, but you know, you and I were talking about this yesterday and it's like this pendulum swing where there is such confusion. I mean, our communities have been so politicized over the last few years and, you know, whether it's in high schools or colleges and creating safe spaces. And I mean, it's, it's, it's overwhelming because finding the right landing spot seems near impossible right now. And, you know, teaching our kids to be upstanders, not bystanders is, I'm, uh, so I'm going to ask this question, but I think there's just so much like aggressive behavior and then fear of engagement. So this question is so much of the social media that fuels this is Snapchat. It's not public. It's not traceable. There's no visibility to adults. How can we coach our kids to be brave voices to help their peer groups address these issues with nuance and patience rather than canceling? It seems like most situations I hear about are way, way, way too late once the adults know about anything going on. I think that is a spot on comment. You know, love to hear your thoughts. So 
Yes. So, I mean, particularly with Snapchat, like they said, like Snapchat is really fleeting. Like posts happen, they kind of disappear. Um, some hang out for like 24 hours, but then they disappear too. Um, that that happens and, and it's much harder to deal with that as parents in terms of participation and monitoring. But most of the stuff that we're talking about with, with kids, right, um, with adults, it tends to happen on Twitter. With kids, it happens on Instagram, right? Because that's where kids are most of the time. There's a lot of kids on Snapchat, but everybody's on Instagram kind of thing. So it happens mostly on Instagram. It can happen on Snapchat, um, but Instagram is where kids are going to go. That's where they say things. That's where things get passed around and passed around and passed around. That doesn't really happen so much on Snapchat. Um, the patience part of that question, I think, is really interesting, right? And so, like I said, teaching kids that, like, really the best thing to do is to take a deep breath, pause, find a grown up around that can support you and get their help in dealing with the situation, right? If somebody does something that hurts or wrongs you. The problem with that, right, is that, like I said, a lot of kids just don't have the patience for that. It's much easier to just be like, you know what, they did this thing, everyone go get them, right? And just sick the masses on them. It works and it's easy, right? The bigger picture issue of that is that we're dealing with a cohort, right? A, a, an entire generation that doesn't trust that the grownups have their back. They don't think the adults are gonna help. And so it's really hard to tell kids, go find a grownup, find an adult who will help you with this. And they're like, talk to me about climate change, talk to me about school shooting. Like the adults don't give a crap, they're not helping us. We're, we have to do this ourselves, right? That is a common and very powerful and pervasive theme for this entire Gen Z, right? And so when I'm working with these kids, I'm really sort of instilling them a sense of hope, a sense of bigger picture. You are included. There are adults that care about what the world is going to look like in five years, 10 years, 25 years, right? And so breaking through, like breaking that sort of bricked wall down for them and getting them to trust adults and reach out for help and not just like rely on themselves to take care of a situation when it goes bad is is honestly part of the problem and will be part of the solution but it, that's a thing right now and it's really hard to convince kids um, that you can rely on the grown-ups we will help you in elementary school they believe us and then they get to middle school and like I said, they get aware, they get woke, they read about climate change, they, they, they look at all this stuff and they're like, wow, like it's going to be up to us to save the world. Like the grownups are just not doing what they need to be doing. So that's their perspective. And it's just really hard to get them to, to sort of be open to something different than that. I think given that we have one minute left, that's a great note to end on. Right, I can go on and on about this. I'm well, wondering. I mean, look, I, I think that the adults on here would agree. We are always learning from our kids. That is not new. That is also age old history that, you know, that's how society progresses. We just have to have our, our, our minds, our hearts and our, our ears open and you know do the best we can but i just you know on behalf of everyone who's here really thank you for what you're doing joe and um we look forward to having you back yeah thank you everyone for to taking time out on such a gorgeous night to um to uh, listen to me talk about this stuff thank you good night <laughs>